I forgot to wipe my glasses off. We're doing great. It's going great. Oh, the table shaking. I'm not used to filming here. Oh. <laughs> oh, okay. Just cute girl things. Okay. Oh. This chair leans back. This is the worst thing I've ever done in my life. Okay, that's a little bit better. Maybe. Hold on. Oh, there's another thing. No, I think, yeah. Okay. Hey y'all, welcome to Clove Room and welcome to the penultimate day of Clovemas. Penultimate is such an underrated word. Like, what a great word is penultimate. But yes, it is the 11th day of Clovemas. Clearly, I am not in my usual filming spot. I am visiting family for the holidays, so I am in my childhood bedroom in Kentucky. And... It is now my mom's office, but you can still see the remnants of my adolescence behind me if you are ever so curious. I think there may be a Kelly Clarkson, a really nice vintage Kelly Clarkson poster in view. But yes, there's a lot of soccer stuff in the background. For some reason, my parents painted this room green. I don't really remember green ever being my favorite color. It doesn't matter. I'm in my childhood bedroom and I'm gonna do a little Q&A for y'all today. I have a lot of new subscribers. I was actually just checking my analytics and I've only really been seriously posting on this YouTube channel f since October is when I decided I wanted to make a commitment to post regularly. I had posted some videos earlier this year in hopes of getting kicking the tires and getting it started, but I feel like the last three months is really when I've started to take this a little bit more seriously. And I have almost 700 subscribers now, which is really cool to me. I my stretch I, I thought it was a stretch goal to get 500 by the end of the year so it's cool to have 700 <laughs> and I looked and out of those like I, I think technically it's 690 now out of the 690 554 are from the last three months <laughs> so I clearly have a lot of new subscribers and I just wanted to do a little Q&A to answer some questions for you all also it's a little bit more of a lighter lift of a video a lot of Clovemas videos have not been light lifts at all so I'm trying to take it a little bit easier these last few days because I am just absolutely exhausted to be honest with the holidays and work and trying to do that along with a YouTube channel and other life events it's just been quite quite a lot. It's been quite a lot. So we're just gonna take it easy today. I've got my Heine Brothers Lavender Cappuccino, which is kind of mid, honestly. It's not terrible, but it's not great. If you're from Louisville, you know what Heine Brothers is. If you're not, then you might. You probably, probably don't. It's a local coffee chain, which I think is actually kind of problematic because I think they're union investors, so shame on you, Heine Brothers, but... It is the only reputable coffee within like 15 miles of my parents' house, so Heine Brothers it is. And let's just go ahead and get started with the questions. I asked y'all to ask me questions on my YouTube community tab. I also asked over on Instagram. I'm over on Instagram at clove underscore room. If you ever want to see more of my face, I post a good amount on stories and then I host, post pot post pop pictures. No, I don't. I don't post pop pictures. I post hot pictures of myself on my grid. So if any of that is interesting to you, go over there and give it a follow. If you like my like more daily opinions on what's going on with like beauty or just random other things, that would be a good place to follow me at. Or again, if you want to see hot pictures of me, that's a good place to follow. Also, uh, I didn't say this in the beginning, but if you do end up enjoying this video, give this video a like. Helps me a lot in the wild, wild west of the YouTube algorithm. Also, go ahead and subscribe if you enjoy it and enjoy learning more about me. But this really is a video just focused on opening up to my current subscribers. Or, if you subscribe now, you can be one of those current subscribers I'm opening up to. Or you could be a stranger I'm opening up to. We, we could act like we're at a bar on Christmas Eve and... I've been craving a whiskey ginger, so or a bourbon ginger, so I'd probably get a bourbon ginger, and then maybe you would think I'm cute and buy me a drink. I, I, don't, I don't know where I'm going with this. I do have another Q&A video I've already posted that is... I may do some repeat questions in here, which is fine, but if you want even more background on me, I have a personal Q&A video that I will link to below that would maybe be a good primer to this Q&A. So I have not taken the time to organize these questions in any 
manner of thoughtfulness or subject. So I'm just going to go through top to bottom on the YouTube community tab questions, and then I'm going to go over to my Instagram and answer those top to bottom. And I hope that is okay. And again, I may have some repeat questions from my original Q&A, but I think that's fine. I like talking about myself. All right, first question. So I'd love to hear more about your gender identity journey. If you already posted a video discussing this, I apologize. I've been questioning my own identity recently, but I'm confused. Also, as a teacher, I have several students who are non-binary, and hearing your thoughts could help me talk to them if they ever want to talk. So I do have... First of all, thank you for asking that question, and don't apologize. Don't ever apologize. No one ever really needs to apologize. I mean, that's that, that, that that's not true. Like, so some of y'all are screaming, and you're like, my dad does! And I bet he does. I bet he does. But for small things, I don't think we need to apologize. Uh, so don't apologize. That's totally fine. I do have vi videos on this just because my gender identity is something that I believe is, like, one of the main spokes of my channel. So I think that so far what I've really enjoyed doing videos on and what I feel like has connected with people the most is conscious consumerism videos, gender identity videos, and this hasn't necessarily connected with people but I really enjoy doing pop culture videos. So those are kind of the three and they aren't like separate at all because I think a lot of those intertwine and interact quite a bit. So kind of beauty's in the middle and then I have those like three spokes that also interact and those that's what I think of my channel right now as again it could evolve more this is still a very young channel and also I think it's always good to evolve but I'm not answering your question. So I do have videos on my gender identity journey that I will point you toward before I go ahead and answer this if you are interested because I think they could be helpful. I actually created a gender euphoria beauty tag with my friend Colin over at Queer Bones. So that has a lot in it about my gender journey with makeup and also just advice I have for gender non-conforming people who are interested in beauty, which I think could be helpful given what you're asking me. So I would go watch my video on that and I would go ahead and watch my friend Colin's. I also would say if you want more on this subject and you may already be subscribed to Colin, but I'll still send you that way. Colin did a really great video on their own gender identity journey that I found really helpful and affirming to watch and I always and, I, and I've recommended that video a lot on my channel but it was just one of my favorites of the year. I, I quite enjoyed it. So I would point you over to that video. I also participated in the trans inclusivity tag recently. I did that a um, couple months ago. That was a tag started by Danny from Scars to Stars Beauty that was more focused on kind of how brands in the makeup industry at large interacts with trans people, but I think that could be of interest to you. I also, in that original video, probably talked about being- I, I talk about being trans in all my videos because I think it's an important part of my life. But my gender identity journey, I came out as trans last year, the year before. It's been a long and arduous journey that has kind of been me being like, no, I think it'd be too hard to be trans, or I don't think I could be trans, right? And it turns out I'm trans. I think the pandemic somewhat affected that. It, it, it's hard to know though because the pandemic affected everything, so I feel like a lot of this would have happened, pandemic or not. Well really, and I talk about this in my gender euphoria tag, beauty is really was my gateway to realizing I was trans, figuring out that I really love applying makeup, and then realizing that makeup was the only thing I liked about my presentation when I started to wear it, and that's how I wanted to start dressing more femme and styling myself more femme, etc, etc. I wasn't sure if I was a binary trans woman or not, and what, what I came to realize is, because non-binary didn't feel right for me, but binary trans woman did, and then I realized I could be both. So I consider myself a non-binary trans woman or non-binary trans person, I kind of change it up how I say it every day. But I don't see myself subscribing or being a part of any gender binary. I've never felt represented by that in my entire life. There are things I like about myself that are more mask that I treasure, and there are things I like about myself or things that I would like my identity to align with that are more femme that I treasure. And I like to just kind of mix it all up. But I do have a deep love and appreciation for femininity, and that's where my trans femme identity comes in, because expressing that through makeup, through clothing, through attitude, through all of it, expressing femininity is a really key 
central part to my identity, so that's why I identify as trans femme non-binary. Like I said, I'll direct you toward those other videos I mentioned, including Collins, and I hope that helped, and I hope your own gender identity journey is going okay, and that you're giving yourself a lot of grace. And a piece of advice I received during mine was that there's really no rush. I know I struggled a lot with not finding an identity and not and being very confused for years and not feeling like I fit in anywhere and there wasn't anyone like me. And, and it's easy for me now to say like, don't rush and don't be stressed about rushing because I the entire time was stressed about just wanting to find a place to call home. But I would just say let yourself iterate. It's, I, I, I think, I think the recent wave of anti-trans backlash has forced us to, when we do talk about this, be like, I always knew. I always knew ever since I was a kid, or I've known since... It, it, it forces us because there's so much questioning of if being trans or gender not conforming is even real. I feel like sometimes we shy away from the public... from, like, the struggle it can be to find your identity and to question, because in more front-facing public situations where there are conservatives or non-supportive parents or non-supportive family, friends, we have to be so sure and be like, no, no, I'm definitely sure. When in reality, it's normal and okay to question your gender identity. It's normal to say I'm this, but then be like, actually, I think I've, I'm, I'm more aligned with this. It's okay, but because our rights are so under attack right now, it feels like it isn't okay to do that, and you have to be like, no, if I'm gonna come out and do it, I have to, have to, have to 100% be sure I'm never gonna change my mind. And it's okay if you change your mind, it's okay if you initially say you're something that maybe you don't end up aligning with at the end of the day, and if people in your life don't give you that grace and don't support you through that, then they're not your friends. <laughs> so I just hope you're giving yourself a lot of grace and allowing yourself, if you are confused, to be confused because it's confusing. <laughs> it's confusing, but it's also really exciting. And I now feel a level of freedom in my life that I've never had now that I've, I, I'm out in trans and not hiding anymore. I say in my childhood better. <laughs> Uh, next question. Are you still project panning? Those are my favorite types of videos that gave me inspo for my own collection or that give me inspo for my own collection. That was one of my first videos I watched of yours. Uh, well, thank you. <laughs> thank you for tuning into my brief project fan. <laughs> I am not, st um, it's interesting. No, I'm not still project panning. I hated, <laughs> I hated doing the update videos. I found the actual project really exciting, but I... Mm. One, I didn't like doing the videos where I'm just like, there's another inch of use, y'all. Hope by paying it next month. Like, that just wasn't exciting for me to film. And it just felt boring. It, it just felt boring. But what I will say is that I actually, the project, if I was still doing it, would have been a mighty success because I'm nearly done with most of the items that were in that project. I mean, I there are some I still haven't hit pan on, but... I would, hopefully, and since you mentioned it, which I really appreciate you mentioning it, I think I'm going to do a video where I... It'll sort of be a Project Pan finale, but what it'll really be is me kind of coming at it from the angle of, I actually technically really succeeded in this Project Pan, but I failed in that I never posted videos about it, so does that mean it's a failed beauty project? And I don't know, and I have a lot of content <laughs> coming for y'all in January about what projects I'm going to do for myself next year, what buying structures I'm going to do, because I got a lot of fabulous feedback when I asked y'all on my last no buy update what structures have worked for y'all in the past after doing no or low buys, and you all had some fantastic feedback. And if you're looking for inspiration for the same thing and you don't want to wait for my videos on it, you should go to that comment section because there was a lot of really thoughtful comments left, which I really appreciated. So I think I have a lot of very commentary, reflecty, talky content coming about how I'm going to approach beauty projects next year. But to answer the question, am I still project panning? No, in that I'm not. I, I don't consider myself a project panner and I don't post updates, but yes, in the fact that I am using up those products and I have usage goals that I'm meeting. So, sort of. 
and I'll probably get back to you with more on that. But thank you for asking. All right, the next one is a two-parter. So first part, what are some of your unpopular opinions about current makeup trends or popular influencers? I have a whole video called Unpopular Makeup Opinions that was earlier this year when I had hair that I really didn't don't like <laughs> but my makeup looked cool in that video and you can go watch that if you want to hear a lot of unpopular opinions I have one unpopular opinion that I also shared in my what the beauty community should leave behind in 2023 video is about mascara gate and also just about how I think the hate that individual influencers get would be better served at being mad at structural issues in the beauty community and in how marketing is governed in the United States. But again, that's in both the unpopular makeup opinions video and it's also in my what the beauty community should leave behind. I'm trying to think if there's any I can give you that I didn't mention either in either of those videos. Okay, <laughs> now that I've actually thought about this. One of the annoying things I find about trends is that they're usually pretty elitist. And what I mean about that is by the time a trend is accessible to folks, so by the time we finally have a lot of products on the market that can do laminated brows, by the time that that's being sold at a price point that the general population, the rural populations can enjoy, by the time that happens is when we say a trend is dead. Because trends, it, it seems like there always has to be an exclusivity to trends and there always has to be a class to trends. Like, not everyone can do a trend. So, by the time, and I know we don't, like, love fast fashion or, like, fast makeup or any of that, but I do just get annoyed when, as soon as a lot of people start doing a trend because they're finally able to, either because of price or just not having products available to them, or it's just now getting to them with the algorithm, that's when we declare a trend dead. I find that very elitist and snobby and not like cute snobby annoying snobby if because so many people especially in the united states and this may be the truth other way in other places so many people maybe can't shop online or don't shop online and they're all they have at their disposal is what's at walmart and dollar general and you know brow elimination products are finally hitting walmart and dollar general at prices that rural people and can afford and are accessible to people and as soon as that happens, that's when we're like, if you eliminate your brows, you're a loser. It's chewy or whatever we're saying. Okay, are you actually over that trend because you don't like it? Or are you annoyed that everyone can do it now? You know, I just find that a little snobby and not fun snobby. Second part of that question. What is something you would like to see more brands doing in 2024? That's a good question. I would like to see more trans representation in product shot in product shots and on social teams and not just on Trans Day of Mem Remembrance or Trans Day of Visibility. I would just love to see it be a more popular thing to include trans folks in your shoots. I would also love to see brands when they do post about influencers or people on their team using pronouns on social media. I think that's a super helpful thing. And I would love to see brands not use gendered language around products or when they're writing their copy for social or or for websites or whatnot to use gender neutral language. Because a lot of times, even if they are trying to be inclusive, they'll just say he or she when they is an option. And I'd love influencers to do that too. There are some people I watch who only use she, her pronouns to describe their audience, which is just not inclusive at all and doesn't feel um nice when you know me I'm a trans non-binary person who uses they them pronouns who has maybe watched them a while or use their affi affiliate links and even if yes YouTube says your audience is primarily women you don't know how much of those may be trans men or non-binary folks or just people who don't use she her pronouns so I wish influencers did a better job of that and I wish brands did a better job of that. Do you make New Year's resolutions if you were to make a beauty resolution other than working on your purchasing? What would it be? I'm gonna save this question. Thank you, Nicole. Nicole from Majestic Beast Beauty asked me this question. 
I am actually, the last video of Clovis is going to be about New Year's resolutions. <laughs> I will talk more in that video about my relationship with New Year's resolutions and about if I will have any because it's something I have been struggling with. Because to be honest, that video was going to be why you shouldn't have New Year's resolutions, but now I have a deep desire to have New Year's resolutions after having a tough December. So I'll get back to you on that, but thank you for asking that. And I'm glad there's some interest in that topic. What are your favorite perfumes? I'm still a Glossier U girl even though I feel like they've done two or three different reformulations since I bought my first bottle. <laughs> Nothing will ever be the first bottle I ever bought. That fragrance would, I, I would put it on sweatshirts, put them away for like the summer and get them back out in the fall and it would still smell like glossy AU. Nothing will beat the OG formula. But I did recently pick up a newer bottle and I still like it. It's still a really pleasant scent. I'm a little scent blind to it. So sometimes I don't smell it on myself, but I'll walk into a room and people will be like, are you wearing glossy AU? And I'm like, yeah, I am. And at this point, this is very much just going with marketing language. It just smells like me. <laughs> like, that's what I think of the scent. So I usually wear glossy, I, I wear glossy at you every day. And it's also a fragrance that's not horrifically expensive. So I feel good just like spraying it all over my body. And then I'll layer it a lot with other things. I really love Boy Smells. That's probably my, if someone was like, what's your favorite fragrance brand? I would say Boy Smells. I'm not super into fragrances, to be honest. I wish I was, but they're just, I, I get priced out a lot and I sometimes, I, I just cannot believe how expensive it is. And it's why I kind of prefer makeup as a <laughs> purchasing vice because at least it's less expensive than how insane a lot of these, especially niche fragrances can be. But I really love Boy Smells. I love Rose Load from them. I just bought a travel size of Vanilla Era, which is very much like a gender, it, it feels like a non-binary vanilla to me because it has a lot of masculinity in it but it still has that femininity of vanilla it's a great night scent i really like it for that i love rose load because i love a floral and it's sort of like a spicier rose smell it's delicious i love rose load i would like rose load if i was somebody who was going out a lot and wearing a fragrance every day i would want rose load to be my signature scent i work at a coffee shop so i don't like my perfume to be overpowering just because I don't know how guests are going to feel about it. I don't know how my coworkers are going to feel about it. So that's why I just wear glossy AU to work usually because I, I just would hate to make somebody uncomfortable because I decided to douse myself in boy smells. And I find that boy smells don't really last all day, but they are pretty intense when you first apply them. I also like... <laughs> This is how I, I don't have a very sophisticated fragrance palette. I love Ariana Grande perfumes. I have, I only have one. I have Ari by Ariana Grande. And Ari by Ariana Grande is a very nostalgic scent for me because I bought it on clearance at Target in Charleston in 2017, 18, at least five years ago, if not more. And I, and I only have like, like I barely have anything left in the bottle, but I can't bring myself to get rid of it because it's not a fragrance I really want to repurchase. But when I smile it, I just think of being chaotic in gay clubs, which is very fun. So that's a very nostalgic scent for me. I will probably, I keep telling myself I'm going to allow myself to get another Ariana Grande one when I am completely done with Ari, but it's just not a scent I want to wear that often unless I am going out because <laughs> it's also very, very sweet. But I do just love how sweet, like Ariana Grande fragrances are kind of what like really bite, bright, like bitten milk blush stick and quickie is to me like they're both just like very femme and gender euphoric even though i i, I don't know there's just something i love about the ariana Gl glande the ariana grande line of fragrances so those are my favorites i would probably have a lot more and it's definitely something i could get into and be really passionate about with the caveat that a lot of fragrances give me headaches and i don't like i was in Sephora and I was like, I kind of want to buy something new, like just like a little travel thing for the winter. And I smelled all of them in Sephora and I did not really like any. So I'm pretty picky and I know very quickly what's going to trigger a migraine. And you're like, okay, you know, it's going to trigger a migraine, but Ariana Grande won't. I don't know what to tell you. She won't. Favorite bands and albums. So, so when you say bands, I'm going to take that as artists because I'm not like a band girl. I mean, if it was technically just band, I would say churches i'm a big churches fan i love their music you've probably heard the mother we share or recover from their first album but their album scents are really quite excellent especially their recent one or their most recent one which is screen violence it's like a concept album based on like horror movies and 
there's a song called Final Girl on there, which Lauren Mayberry herself has confirmed is a song for trans for the trans girls, and it is a great song. And that's just a great album. I love that album. And I actually just made a playlist called For the Trans Girls, which is songs that I think are spiritually and musically for the trans girls, and Final Girl is the first song on it. <laughs> but I love Churches. I love Fleetwood Mac. That's a band I've loved since high school, and I adore them. I love the Counting Crows. I always joke that the straightest thing about me <laughs> is that I love the Counting Crows. <laughs> August and Everything After is one of the most perfect albums ever made. It's just a banger, and that's definitely one that I like because my dad. And then, in terms of artists, not bands, I'm a big Taylor Swift fan. I've talked about that before. I love Casey Musgraves. I've been very... It's, it's interesting, because I'd say my fa favorite Casey Musgrave albums are more Golden Hour, which is definitely her most popular crossover one, or same trailer, Different Park, which is her debut one, and her most, like, traditional country one. I actually love country music, fun fact about me. I am from Kentucky, and I do love country music. And I love same trailer, Different Park. It's a great album. And, it's been, and I love Golden Hour. But lately because of life events, I have been really getting into Starcross. I don't even know if I'd necessarily say it's super poppy. I just think it's her least country album. And it was, I, I would say it's probably my least favorite of hers, but I've been really vibing with it lately. It's her divorce album. <laughs> and I'm glad you asked favorite albums because I am not a playlist person usually. I know I just talked about ma making a playlist, but I love a front to back album and I listen to albums mostly. So Evermore by Taylor Swift, Red by Taylor Swift are like probably my two favorites from her. One of my favorite albums, I will always be one, one of my favorites is Velvet Rope by Janet Jackson. That is an album that I first listened to in 20... <sighs> might have been 2016 actually. It was an album I first listened to during my Charleston era. And I remember listening to it and being like, how was this made in 1998, I believe? 97. I think it was made in 1997. How was this made in 1997? Because sonically and lyrically, if it came out today, it would be brave and bold. Like, it is an album about depression, anxiety, sexuality, gender identity. There's even a song about feeling hopeless when online dating, which is... It, it's, it's just such a... It's an album, and I think this a lot about Janet's work, and Janet is probably my favorite pop star, like, traditional pop star. I think when you watch, when you listen to The Velvet Rope, or when you watch The Velvet Rope tour, you realize why artists do what they do today. Because if you listen to, like, new R&B that's a little bit more darker and melancholy with its production, so much of it has to do with Velvet Rope. And then when you watch mainstream pop tours, like the, like the Eras tour would not be what it is today without the Velvet Rope tour happening. You should, if you are somebody who loves pop music, you should go watch the Velvet Rope tour on YouTube because it is, I think it's still up and it is just, you see how everything she does is so fresh and new, but then you also see how everyone after her, like Beyonce, Rihanna, Taylor Swift, Britney, all of them, Postal Service, give up their only album, but I love that album. That's when I listen to front to back a lot. My December by Kelly Clarkson is, I, I've, if you see the Kelly Clarkson poster on the back, that's one of my favorite albums because it got me through a lot of middle school <laughs> and is, was, helped me through some really hard times. I love, love, love My December. Probably, and probably my favorite album of all time, gun to my head would be Preacher's Daughter by Ethel Kane. And that's one that came out a lot more recently. That album I listened to, I think four out of the five songs from my top five Spotify rap this year were from that album. <laughs> Which you've listened to, you're probably like, what is wrong with you? And I'm like, I know. <laughs> but that album is just, it's a concept album and it's so dark, but it is the best Southern Gothic interpretation of religious trauma. Of, of the intersectionality between religious trauma, being trans, and being lost that I've ever heard or seen, read, any of it. It's just brilliant. It's utterly brilliant. And even though it's so sad and a hard listen, I listened to it constantly, especially earlier this year. There's a song called Sun Bleached Flies on it that is... Mm, if I were ever to get a song's lyrics tattooed on me, it would be Sun Bleached Flies. But I'll move on because I could talk about this for a lot. 
for a long time. I would love to do more content around music or just like favorite pop culture favorites if anybody would be interested in that. Tips on how and when to collab with others. I was actually thinking about this one when I saw this comment posted because I was like, huh, tips on how to collab with others. Because I just started it. Like I had three collabs this Clovemas I was all very happy with and were really fun. They were with my friends. And my first inclination and the one I think I'm going to go with is just make sure there's somebody you respect and trust with your audience. Because I think a lot of people are like, you should collab when it's going to be mutually beneficial and you'll both gain subscribers and etc. Which like, I guess that's important things to think about. But for me, one of the things I was happiest about or just made me, I guess, happy and proud was Tom mentioned and when we did our collab, they mentioned in their video, I trust Cam with my audience so I really want y'all to go and subscribe to them. That was something I just really appreciated that Tom said and I think that's the most important thing I would say is don't let numbers or clout or that kind of businessy influencer stuff dictate collabs. I would do collabs with people you trust with your audience. Because there are a lot of people I could probably, or I, I wouldn't have the shot. But if I collabed with a Jeffree Star, for instance, that would probably be really on paper beneficial to me because he has a ginormous audience. And I would gain a lot of subscribers because millions of people love Jeffree Star. However, <laughs> I would not actually gain much from that because I don't think he's ethically a good person. And also his audience isn't necessarily what I think mine would be just because I'm more interested in what I'm interested in and he doesn't think non-binary people <laughs> exist. So you know what I mean? Um, it's just, I would say there, there's probably other things that are more helpful that you can learn from consultants, but I feel like the most important thing is just making sure you trust the person you're collabing with, making sure they're an ethical person and like being comfortable giving basically, because when you collab with somebody, you're basically like, I sign off with what this person does. And if it's a person that has done things that you don't agree with or acts in a certain way in the beauty space and that's not within your code of conduct, even if you may have something to gain, I would say you should not do that. I guess my other tip is don't be afraid to reach out to people because I, Colin and Tom reached out to me and then I reached out to Ivy to do my collab, but I was honestly... I, I was waiting on people to reach out to me to collab because I didn't want to be a burden on anyone. Like, pressure people into collabing and, like, getting them to do something they maybe wouldn't want to do or having to put them in an awkward position of saying no. But now I feel like I probably could have, if I wanted to, had asked and it would have been fine. So I would say ask. Shoot your shot. Um, if you do really want to collab with somebody, at least get the conversation going. Also, even if... I, I would say get it going because... You know, I have a collab that I'm hopefully doing with Ivy next year that is not going to happen for a while because it's a little bit more of a lift than either of us is capable of doing right now. I'm laughing because we're both a mess right now. <laughs> Our Instagram DMs are just like, this bad thing just happened. And then the other one's like, I'm so sorry, this bad thing just happened to me. <laughs> so who knows when that more ambitious collab will happen. But it's good to go ahead and get the conversation started and get and have each other thinking about it and maybe put it on the calendar. I don't think either of us know what our calendars are right now, but down the road, that'll be good. <laughs> Holiday traditions. I, I was thinking about this one too, and this is interesting, but I think my favorite holiday tradition is the Christmas Eve candlelight service at my dad's church which may some, come somewhat as a shocking answer. I'm a preacher's kid. I'm a double preacher's kid, actually. And I have a strained relationship with the church. I still consider myself a, a religious person, not spiritual even, but religious. And I think religious traditions can be really beautiful and special. And I think when we talk about eradicating religion, we sometimes fail to realize how much good religion does in community spaces and creating spaces for folks who maybe don't have a place to go or who don't have family, things like that. Because I have, throughout my life, seen a lot of good from the church. I've also seen a lot of not great stuff, so it's not a, something I do a lot or participate in a lot. 
because it does make me nervous and I don't go to places where I can't be myself. That's just a rule I follow. And even in more accepting churches, I feel like I always have to, even if it's like, you know, we got rainbow flags outside and we got drag queens leading the service, there's still like, I'm still like, okay, I'm 95% myself here. There's still 5% I have to hold back. And I think that's just anxiety and just past religious um, trauma. But I love a Christmas Eve candlelight service. And I just, there's something about singing Silent Night when everyone has all their candles lit the advent wreath, just the kind of spooky, and it, I'm doing this in Kentucky, the spooky southern gothicness of going to a church, and ours is really late, it's like at 11 p.m., going to a church really late at night, just there's like a, a melancholy spiritual community aspect that I've never gotten anywhere else in my life, and it's just like all the best parts of the church to me or the Christmas Eve service the hymns the, and be, being able to sing with people one of my favorite tweets and funniest tweets of all time was somebody tweeted basically I always thought I like I always thought I loved church so much and it was my favorite place to be and then I went to a Harry Styles concert and I realized I just like singing with people <laughs> and that is just so true there's something about singing with people singing Christmas carols with people less about even the content of the carols but just like being in a community space together and wanting to all coming there because you want to be a better person there's something beautiful about that now when we get into the specifics of the rules and the regulations especially the harm that larger christian denominations and organizations have done in this world that's when we that's when it starts to sour but i do love a christmas eve candle light service and other holiday traditions i love a peppermint mocha love a peppermint mocha i still have not had a good one this year maybe i'll go do that this afternoon i'll go have because i have tried a couple of times to have like because i only get a few every year and i have not had a good one yet unfortunately which is really sad but i love a peppermint mocha and what else I do love putting ornaments on the tree and listening to Christmas music while I do that. And I love watching my favorite movies. I love Love Actually. I know that's a trash opinion. It's technically a terrible movie, but I do love Love Actually. I watched The Holiday with, with my friend this year. That's a good one. But those are some of my favorite holiday traditions. Do you like to read? If so, what? I do like to read. I'm really bad at reading though. <laughs> the cycle I follow, and this is something I've just come to accept, is that I read a lot in the first part of the year when I'm trying to better myself. Life gets busy, life gets stressful, I stop, and then over the summer I usually try to start reading again, and then in the fall, winter, I usually stop again, and then by that point it's a new year, and then I start again. So it's that sort of cycle. <laughs> I love queer and LGBTQ plus books, <laughs> believe it or not. <laughs> I love reading about history you don't necessarily learn, like about just queer spaces. I read a couple of really good books. One was When Brooklyn Was Queer. The other one was actually about the Atlanta queer scene of the 70s, 80s. Night at the Stereo Gumball? A Night at the Sweet Gum Head. Wasn't my favorite. Like, the way it was written was a little bit confusing and probably needed a little bit more polishing, but the content was very interesting. So it was about the 1970s gay Atlanta, which was fascinating. Because I think it's somewhat frustrating to me because so much LGBTQ plus history is ignored and everyone's like, wow, it's so great that we finally have things that are gay and trans. And it's like, people have always been <laughs> gay and trans. I mean, there's Spaces have always existed. They just haven't always existed in public. And... There's so many time on our traditions from those spaces that I think are worth knowing. So that's like kind of my favorite nonfiction genre. I also love reading novels about queer and trans people. My favorite book of all time is probably The Prettiest Star by Carter Sickles. He is from Ohio, I think. I think he's from Appalachian, Ohio, but he teaches at Eastern Kentucky University in Kentucky. And I, oh, I actually first read his work in an anthology that was queer writers, queer trans writers from Appalachia. It was like a nonfiction, actually it was 
nonfiction and fiction. It was just an anthology book that was put together that I actually found in Carmichael's in Louisville, if you're from Louisville. And I loved that book. It introduced me to so many incredible queer Appalachian or trans Appalachian authors, which is something that is can be really hard to find. So if you're interested in any of those spaces, I would highly recommend that book. I'll link it below. I'll, I'll actually link it because I don't link my makeup yet because I Affiliate links will be a whole different conversation for next year. And also just linking things. I feel like I'm not getting into that right now. But I will actually give a link to these books because they're worth, like, they're worth you buying. <laughs> and I read Carter Sickle's piece in that and I loved his writing. He's a trans man. And he wrote a book called The Prettiest Star that is about basically a man from Appalachian, Ohio returning home from New York to die after contracting HIV AIDS. And it is heartbreaking. <laughs> it is. And, and it's, and it's not like sticky, sweet, sad, or overly sentimental sad. It is just a, it, it sort of represents Appalachia and that it is cold and dark and a hard book to read because it is devastating. He doesn't spare any it's it's the best it's one of the best encapsulation of the region's attitudes towards lgbtq plus people because it's not cartoony and it's written by somebody who's actually from the area but it depicts the hardships you go through and especially during such a heated time where there was so much misinformation around hiv and aids it's it's a heartbreaking book, but it is, it, it's one I thought about. I, I still think about it all the time, but after I read it, I was like, I really enjoyed that book. That was a great book, but I kept thinking about it because it was so poignant. And it's interesting because it, it's, it's all a novelization. It's all fiction, all the names and characters, but it, there is a snippet that happens in the book that's based on a real life incident where somebody who was HIV positive went into a public pool in Ohio I think it was Ohio, and it caused a bunch of controversy and undue, unscientific, homophobic backlash because of worries that a, an HIV-positive person merely walking into a pool would, everyone would contract HIV. And it, it's just, I think it's a book everyone should read, because it, it's, again, it's like, it's devastating, but it is necessary. It's a necessary devastation. And that's probably my favorite book of all time. There's also Norwegian Wood by Haruki Murakami. And that is a book that stayed with me a lot after I read it too. I really want to read more from him because it, it was just such a beautifully written and deeply, <laughs> deeply devastating book. I guess I like sad books. I, li I like sad books. On the flip end, I also do like queer young adult, like, fi like fiction, or even not queer. Like I... Like, for years, John Green was my favorite author. I love Looking for Alaska. That's a book that changed my life when I read it in high school. Because it was the first time I saw my sense of humor and sort of just sense of self of being very snarky and very sarcastic, but also introverted. It, it's just that, that that book, as problematic as John Green's work can be, changed my life and changed my understanding of who I want, who, who I am. So uh, Looking for Alaska is definitely a book that made me as well. Also, Redefining Realness by Janet Mock is a book that changed my life. Even though it wasn't years until after I read it that I started identifying as trans, that book and Surpassing Certainty, which is her second book, her follow-up to that, both her memoirs changed the course of my life too, I believe. And that's actually where I learned about The Velvet Rope by Janet Jackson, where she wrote about how life-changing that album was for her to listen to when it came out. She was becoming herself. And those books are beautiful. I love both those books. And they're pretty, they're, they're written in a little bit more of an approachable way. So I, I would actually say to the first question, if you're questioning your gender identity, those are good books to read too, because she discusses a lot of that. All right, Chloe, formerly of Chloe Enchanted, asked me some questions on Instagram, but Chloe has a new Instagram account that I will put on screen and that I will link below that you should go follow if you previously followed Chloe Enchanted. I think she's moving into more like fashion content, kind of lifestyle content on that account, but I, she's a voice I really enjoy. 
and I quite enjoy her aesthetic. So go follow her new Instagram account if you were like, where did that Chloe Enchanted go? She went to a new account. So go follow that if you're interested. She asked me a bunch of questions on Instagram, which I appreciate. Any crushes? Jonathan Groff. <laughs> I have a big crush on Jonathan Groff. And I like... I, I tend to like older men, but I when someone asked me this, it's like, I, there's a lot of people I find attractive, but it's hard to like pull them out once I am asked. Hi, I was thinking about this later. I, I'm not saying this instead of Jonathan Groff because Jonathan Groff is one of my two main crushes, but the one I was forgetting was Jonathan Bailey. Jonathan Bailey is my ultimate crush. That is my dream man, short king, so hot. Oh, I love Jonathan Bailey, very attracted to him and the voice. Least favorite food. I'm pretty open when it comes to eating. I actually don't enjoy eating a ton of meat, so I think I may actually go back to being vegetarian next year, because I was vegetarian for a long time and I kind of miss it. I will really try any food. There's not a type of food I like less than others. I don't like olives. And this is a weird one, but sun-dried tomatoes. I love tomatoes. I love tomatoes. But something about sun-dried tomatoes always gives me a migraine. Specifically sun-dried tomatoes. So I don't like sun-dried tomatoes on things. And olives. There's something else that I'm missing that I cannot remember what it is. Because there's like really two... Because I actually do like the taste of sun-dried tomatoes, but something about it messes with my body. I do not like olives. Oh gosh, what's the other thing? It's gonna kill me. Oh, I don't like cherries. I don't like cherries. I like artificial cherry, <laughs> but I don't enjoy eating a cherry for some reason. I don't like a cherry. So cherries and olives and then some dried tomatoes because they give me a migraine. Favorite article of clothing? <sighs> my favorite article of clothing? I love all my glacier hoodies. <laughs> Those just give me a hug every time I put them on. And when I know I'm going to have a bad day, I put on a glacier hoodie. I have a dress from Urban Outfitters that I got from their sales section that I really adore and that I feel like fit, fits me really well. I have a skirt from Target that's like sort of a silk-esque material that I really love to wear all year round. That's definitely one of my favorites. And I just love like a cami. Like I love a lot of my camis that I bought recently because they just give me gender euphoria and I just love a spaghetti strap on me. I think I look really hot in a spaghetti strap. Oh, and then I also love my lavender dress. I got a Target to wear to the Taylor Swift Eras tour. That's definitely a favorite too. City you would love to live in. I really love living in Atlanta, actually. I am very happy there. The only other place I'd probably move in the US is Chicago, potentially. And I've lived in Chicago before, and I do really like Chicago, but I think I like Atlanta better. And I would probably move back to Kentucky one day, although that's becoming less likely as we go on in life, but a dream would be Amsterdam. Or even just like somewhere in like rural Netherlands. Like I would love to live in the Netherlands. Living in the Netherlands is my one of my biggest goals in life to live there at least for like six months to a year at some point, I think would be really, really incredible. I studied abroad there in college. I did a summer in Amsterdam and yeah, I would love to live in Amsterdam. But again, I wouldn't even have to live in like Amsterdam, Amsterdam. I'd be happy with like a suburb or, or, or even like Harlem, but I just love Dutch culture and I love the Netherlands <laughs> and I really want to go back and visit because I haven't gone back and visited since I studied abroad there in 2016. Favorite food. Oh, so we just did least favorite foods and then we'll do favorite. I love Indian food. I love chickpeas. I'm a big chickpea person. I'm a big chickpea curry person. I make a really good like chickpea curry, chickpea sweet potato curry. I love tofu. <laughs> tofu is probably like my, like if there was one food I could have for the rest of my life, it'd probably be tofu because you can do so much with it. You can do a tofu scramble. You can make it really crunchy. You can transform the texture a lot. You can use it for for dressings and sauces, or you can just like have tofu as tofu. And I love the flavor of tofu. I know a lot of people don't, but like that soy tofu flavor. I love it. I love tofu. 
So I love tofu. I love Thai food. I love like a drunken noodle with tofu. I love Mexican food. I love a chimichanga. I specifically love like crappy Kentucky Tex-Mex food because that's what I grew up on. So one of my favorite meals is like going to one of those Tex-Mex spots, getting chips and salsa, ordering a queso for the table, maybe getting like a little cheese enchilada or a chimichanga. Mm. There's this place in Chicago that's an all vegan Mexican place. Ooh, it is so good. It is so good and it's all vegan. I love it. I'm pretty sure it's Quesadilla La Reina del Sur on Western in Chicago. They make the best vegetarian and vegan Mexican food ever. It is astounding what they do. <laughs> what beauty? Oh, my friend asked me some beauty gymnastics questions, <laughs> Mackenzie. Hey, Mackenzie. What beauty product equates to a triple wolf turn? I would say the Rare Beauty lip oil. And for those who don't know, gymnastics fans, we hate, we hate wolf turns. They're just ugly. We're over them. And they're overvalued in the code. I'm not going to explain what that means. What beauty product equates to Simone's Devil Yurchenko Pike Vault, Sunni's Artistry on Bars? I would say this Hourglass palette equates to <laughs> Simone's Double your Chanko Pike because it does the impossible and is beautiful. This is the hourglass palette that I just received as a friend mail and I am obsessed with it. As soon as artistry on bars, I would say the Glossier Skin Tint because it's subtle yet spectacular, just like Suni's technique. Your go to coffee or drink at your shop. I. We have a seasonal drink right now that's like a lavender Earl Grey latte that is incredible. I especially like doing it with a less, with not a latte ratio of milk, but with a cappuccino ratio of milk. So like a smaller mug. On most days though, I'm just like an Americano girl. We offer two different types of espresso at our shop, at the shop I work at. So one's like a more regular kind of traditional chocolatey nutty espresso. And then the other one's typically more fruity. And I really love an Americano instead of a drip coffee because I like tasting the espresso more and it's a little bit more vibrant to me. So I love getting an Americano with the more fruity kind of funky espresso. That's like probably my comfort drink at our shop. And then a uh, lavender Earl Grey cappuccino when we have that syrup is really good. Who and what types of people give you inspo? I think the type of people that give me inspo are ones who just do it and not to make it this video. <laughs> and that's why I'm so excited to partner with Nike for this video. No, I mean, I just love when I can tell somebody hasn't thought, can I? Because I always am constantly being like, can I? Can I? And I'm like, like, I'm starting to unlearn that. But when I can tell somebody has never asked, can I before? And but whether that's their style, their makeup, their hair, their attitude, I just am always like, wow, why are you so hot? I don't know. And it's a burden I deal with every day, but it's one that, um, again, I'm unlearning the toxicity around every day. And like I say, it's a burden to be hot and good at everything. I wake up every day upset. I'm not you. That's not the first time I've heard that. <laughs> <laughs> Am I kidding though? Um, that's very sweet. Also, the person asking me these <laughs> questions is like someone who's cooler than me. Cosmetic Knot on Instagram, and I love their account, and it's weird. Or not weird, it's cool. It's cool they watch my channel, but it's just whenever somebody I've previously followed and really liked their content starts watching my content, and they're like, I genuinely love your channel. Like Multichromatica asked me questions, and he's somebody I followed for a bit and I really and or I have just seen his work I think before I even followed him and it's just when they're when people like that are like I really love your channel I'm like thank you you watch <laughs> that's crazy to me but very sweet um I wake up every day upset I'm not you honestly cause many not post the hottest pictures like I they're right up there in hotness with mine like if you want to follow the hottest people on Instagram follow us so that's all the questions I got thank y'all so much for watching I've been filming for a while now oh my god it's 4 30 wow but this was a lot of fun I hope you enjoy just a nice casual chatty Q&A if you have any other questions you want me to answer leave them in the comments I would love to hear your thoughts on what I said in the comments again give this video a like if you did enjoy it and subscribe if you want to see future videos including the last day of Clovemas which should be posted the day after this is posted I think it's gonna be posted 
I think this is going to be posted on Christmas Eve. Last video is going to be posted on Christmas Day. So, giving you some Christmas content if you need it. Bye, y'all.